Hey, Carpenter, and live from Rome. How does it all begin, the, the finding of music for you? Where does this start for you? Well, it all started when I was about eight years old, right? I liked this song, right? That my mother used to play all the time. It was called Raindrops by D. Clark. Hmm? Oh, really? And I remember that my mother had a record player. You know, at the time, there were only record players. There weren't, like, stereo systems. and It was just, you know, a box with a record player inside. Mm -hmm. Put the mm -hmm. record on and play. You know, two little speakers in the front. You know? so my, when, my mother, when my mother would go out, she didn't want us to have seven brothers, and my mother didn't want us to touch that record player. You know, so she put it on a high shelf. And every time when my mother would go out, I wanted to hear that song over and over and over again. I just loved that song. So I had to climb up on a ladder, right, to, to get up to the, to the shelf that she put it on, you know, to play that song. And, and that was the beginning of my obsession with, with music, buying music and well, playing music in the house. Well, mm -hmm. guess well, guess what? We got that song, so we're going to play it. So, Richie, bring up the volume <laughs> Are on you the... serious? <laughs> <laughs> You know, my, my mother was a big Tom Jones fan. Oh, really? <laughs> she was in love with him. <laughs> wow, 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 wow. So going from now, this is Brooklyn now. What years would you say these are? Okay. Oh, my God. That was in... Um, and where um, were you at that period of your life? That was in 1966, something like that. Okay. It was a long, you know, it was a long, long time ago, brother. Mm -hmm. I, know, I know, but where where was that now? Now you were living in New York. Were you in Brooklyn? I was living in Brooklyn. Okay. I was living in Brooklyn, and 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 my family we grew up in a housing project called Farragut Houses. Farragut. I know the project. We called we call projects at that time. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. Now they call it the Farragut condos or whatever you want it because it's been yeah, so far, right? Yeah. Amazing. Using yeah, that? they're trying. That's what they're doing now. You better believe it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's high class living over there now, but before it was a ghetto. Now tell us, now tell us, yeah, right. Tell us what New York was like in those days as a young guy, you know, growing up. Give us, you know, take us to your vision. Well, well you know, when I lived in the, in the projects, right, it was a, a, a pretty much the projects was all black. You know? uh -huh. and, and, and during that era, right, you know, if you came, if you were white and you came to the projects, you can get your, you can get your butt kicked. Losing, and and vice versa. You know, if, if if you know, if I went to like Bensonhurst or something like that, you know, like all white neighborhood, you know, I could be run out. You know, right. chased down, beat down. You so know, truth. So truth to be said, it was a segregated neighborhoods. They were in those yeah, days. Yeah. Well, to me, it still is in many ways. When you look at New York, New York is still segregated in many ways, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. You got the rich area and you got the poor area, mm -hmm. <laughs> but now you got less of the poor area because the poor areas are becoming all rich areas. Everybody that couldn't afford to live in Manhattan, they all move into Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx, even. You know? Yeah, we would think that in those days, like we used to drive. Remember going to Bushwick? How bad it was. Now you're mm -hmm. talking about you live where Bushwick. <laughs> Even for a black man, Bushwick was a difficult neighborhood to walk through because you never know you get sticked up, robbed, knocked, because mm -hmm. the drugs were bad. Bed-Stuy and all that there. Bed-Stuy used to be a rough neighborhood, but now, you know. Crown Heights? Yeah, now I hear it's like, like $3,000 for a one-bedroom apartment. Mm -hmm. I know, I know. So, pre, this is all pre-disco. We're talking now, it's the mid-60s. <laughs> Things are yes, going. You're from in, the disco era. You're, going, yes. you're in school, and you're doing yes. your thing. You're finishing yes. up. Well, you're in mm -hmm. high school. Mm -hmm. Take us right through high school, 17, 18, when things start to really start cooking. Where are you well, uh, well, I'm going to tell you, right? You know, when I was about, uh, let's see, when, when I started to work at the Galaxy 21, right? Ooh. Well, let, let me, let's start out this way. The first time I went to a club in Manhattan, I had a bunch of girls with me. I had like, oh my God, like 10 girls. And it was just me. I was the only guy. And they were like, come on, let's all go out. We're going to go out, right? So we went to this club. It was in, um, it was in 1975. And we went to this club called, called The Hollywood, where Richie Kazar was playing. You know? and, and after that club, right? This is the first time that I'm going out of Manhattan, right? After that club, the club closed like four o'clock in the morning, and somebody said, "Someone said, oh my God, there's a, there's an after hours club. You can want to go to another club. We know an after hours club called the Galaxy Twenty One." So 
I, we, we went to that club, it was like four or five in the morning, you know, and the DJ, Walter Gibbons, was playing. Mm -hmm. I had never um, heard of him, but the, the, the club was amazing. It had like four floors. It was just an amazing venue. You know? And when I saw that console, and I saw Walter Gibbons playing, and I heard that music he was playing, all I could think of is I got to get find a way to get into that room. I got to find a way to get into that DJ booth. Mm -hmm. So... You know, I, I think that, that Walter kind of took a liking to me. You know what I'm saying? And he was giving me, like, the, the eyes from the DJ booth and all that there, right? So he, he looked at me, and he kind of, like, waved his finger. He said, come inside. Right? Oh, he invited you the first night you were there? He, the first time, right. The first time I went to the club. How is that possible I'm, that you walk in the club first night and you're in the, the booth? First night, right. Ever yeah. in a club, ever, and first night, no less. Right, yeah. So I, I get inside the, the, the console. Well, they call it the DJ booth at that time. Now it's the console. Mm -hmm. you know? And I look around and I see all of the, the equipment and, and the, you know, the way he had the turntable suspended and all of this. I was amazed by it, right? And I, I see the lighting console over there, but nobody's working the lights. You know, there's a console for the lights, but nobody's working it. So I go over there flicking switches. What's this? What's this switch for? I start turning switches, right? You know? And, and, you know, I just kind of just started playing the lights. I never did lights before, but I just started working with the lights. And Walter tells me, Walter says, you know, I like the way you're doing those lights. How would you like the, the, the job as the light man? Wow. So I said, sure, you know. So the next week, I had the job working the lights at the Galaxy 21. Hmm? Now, <laughs> now, I'm going to tell you, right? <laughs> When I work the lights, right? I, uh, people, when you see lights in clubs now, they just pretty much run on a computer. You know, the guy turns the computer off on well, and then he goes down. Mm. That's true, but unless Ariel's working them and he's feeling Right, he's right. Fierce. Well, Ariel, Ariel was inspired by me in many ways. <laughs> yeah. you know, he has said this many times, right? But anyway, I got fired from the Galaxy 21, long story short. I worked there for a year, right? And the reason that I got fired is because they had a white light, right? Whenever the break would come, when the big breakdown would come or whatever, I would flash the house lights and then I would throw the whole room into darkness, right? And so anyway, the, um, the owner, he didn't like that, right? Why? He didn't, the owner, he didn't like, he told me, I don't like you using that, that house light. Don't put those white lights like that. You know what I'm saying? So he had warned me a couple of times, right? And then one day he hang came on, and he was very on. angry. He hang on, can we can we play a song that would recognize Walter Gibbons and Galaxy Twenty One? Yes, please. Let's let's. Would you like to hear? Would I would say "Hit and Run" by Lily Holloway? That's the one. That's the one that Walter produced. And how big is the dance floor, Galaxy? You got to give people an idea. Like, what's the the, the the dance floor in Galaxy Twenty One would have held about six hundred people. Okay, so it was more intimate than it was more intimate. But they had four floors, but they didn't have another floor of music. The other floors, right? So it was only one. You know, at that time, you know, in the seventies, they never had two rooms of music. There was always even a studio. There was never like a privé with another DJ or whatever. It was right. one DJ. Right. But they sometimes they would um, um, pump the music upstairs too. They had a connection where you could hear what's being played downstairs, upstairs as well. Mm -hmm. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay, so now we're back to you working the lights and the owner is oh. not happy with your services. Why? Right. So, so he tells me, right, he had warned me about the white light a couple of times, right? So one, one night he, he came and he was pissed, right? And he said, because I had um, flashed a white light or whatever, and he came, he said, I told you, you don't work that white light again. He said, if you if you flash that white light again, you're fired. You understand? Mm -hmm. And that's all you need to tell so, Kenny Carpenter. Go ahead. Right. I know Kenny so, Carpenter. Anybody knows Kenny Carpenter knows, don't tell him not to do it. Don't so ever. As he, was leaving the, the, as he was leaving the booth, the big break in the record came. And I turned up all of the lights, you know what I'm saying? And then I flashed that white light and I threw the room into darkness, right? And after that, he came to the booth and he told me, you're fine. You understand? You're fine. <laughs> you understand? Like, oh, you understand me? Read my lips. You're <laughs> out of here. Right. 
But you know one thing, when one door closes, another one opens. Well, that's right? the next, that was the question we was going to go, okay. Because you know, right. Richie was talking about that before as well. You know how mm -hmm. he worked at Paul Anka's club in Vegas, because that's how he went mm -hmm. out there, and another door opened. So you tell mm. us now your door that opened. What was that? So, so there was a, there was a, a there was a, that the club had two owners, right? And this guy named Angelo Clemente, right? He was um, um, one of the, the co-owners of the club, right? Absolutely, surprisingly, after he fired me, right? Three, three weeks later, the club closed down. <laughs> they were not in business. <laughs> That's because they, they had terrible lighting going on. Yeah, That's Kenny, what happened? You, you took the lighting ideas with you? They couldn't handle it? was like, that? where's the good lights? That's it. We're closing. <laughs> lighting is so, dead. Lighting's done. So the other, the other owner, right? The other owner, he told me, listen, I'm opening up my own club on 19th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues. Right? It's called the Inferno. How would you like to come and work the lights for me over there? Hmm? That was in um, um, 1976 or 77, something like that. Right? So I said, sure, why not? So I, 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 I left um, um, that Galaxy 21 and I started working the lights at the Inferno. The Inferno was a huge club, two floors, right? It had um, the, the dance floor held about a thousand people, something like that, maybe about 1,200. Then they had a huge basement that was almost the size of the, the, the main floor. You know? And that was like lounge, coat room, everything. You know? So I worked at that club for seven years doing lights. And every DJ that you could imagine, Walter Gibbons played there, um, Tony Smith, John Monaco. Remember John Monaco? He played there for a while. Um, Renee Hewitt. You know? I, I, I saw DJs come and go, right? Oh, I know you did. Right, yeah, but but at that time, during that time, from the time that I worked at the Galaxy Twenty One, right, even before that, I I I had learned how to play music. Well, maybe I should start from here. Strafe, right? Yes, Strafe. Strafe who's Strafe? Artist. First, so hang on, you gotta tell us who Strafe is for those who don't know. Strafe, okay, Strafe. His real name is Stevie Standard, right? But Strafe is is um, 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 was a DJ at that time, and later on, he of course he he um, um, he made the song "Set It Off." He was an artist, Strafe, and he had a huge record called "Set It Off," mm -hmm. which was major in New York. As which you know. Walter Gibbons, which Walter Gibbons, <laughs> and Walter Gibbons did the remix, which which Strafe hated. He hated the remix <laughs> that he did, <laughs> right? But it was still a major hit, and Strafe was responsible for me becoming a DJ. Because in, in the in the in the mid seventies, right, him and I became very good friends. He lived in the same building that I lived in, the, the, where I lived, and and he asked me to go on the road with him. He said, "I want you to, to you know." I, I went to his house and played around with some some music that he had or whatever. And he says, "I really like the way you DJ. Why don't you come on the road with me? I'm going to give you a nickname. I'm going to give you a DJ nickname, and your DJ nickname is called Moon Dust." That's what we're going to call you. <laughs> so that was my first DJ named Moondus. And I did a lot of community parties, community events with him. And and it was just great. Okay. So so he was the one that was, that's responsible. Wonderful. For, and I forgot where I was going with that. But, but that's where you started before the job came, you know, Bonds and Studio. Oh, oh, I know where I was going, right? So, so during the time that I was the light man, even at Galaxy 21, and when I was the light man at the Inferno, I knew how to play records. Okay, can I interrupt you for a second? Mm -hmm. A lot of people never got to hear Walter Gibbons play, and you were blessed to be the light man there for a while. As a yeah. DJ, can you tell people what he was like? Because a lot of people say he was the first at this, the first at that. I'll tell you one thing about Walter Gibbons, right? You see these these guys that do these edits, these extended edits now, you know, and they um and they use mostly a computer to do it, right? Right. Walter Gibbons used to do those edits live. What? He used to do like like um 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 happy song. Remember happy song by Rare Earth? Do -do -do. Right. Remember those, those songs in the those songs in the beginning. That that was only about a minute before the song started, right? Or maybe less. He used to 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 loop that live. He Seamless? would play, we no have mistake. two copies of it, and he would just keep playing the beginning over and over and over again. And it was flawless. Flawless. Walter Gibbons was one of the most talented DJs I ever heard in my life. And he really
really was a, a big inspiration for me, that guy. Well, let me ask and let me ask DJ, you. DJ, but remixer, producer, he did it. He was the first one to do it that, that I knew. I didn't know anybody that did it at his at his level. Where does Francois play in Galaxy Twenty One in that era? Francois, when I when I met Francois, I met Francois um, shortly after I started working at the Galaxy Twenty One The Lights. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know, I, I don't know who brought him in, right, whatever, but Francois was the drummer. They Francois was Francois the drummer. Yeah, and Francois used to play drums during the, um, during the um, Walter Gibbons set. He'd be there with the drum set, you know what I'm saying? Wow. And I hated it. <laughs> oh I hated, you know, <laughs> you know, when I, when I first met Francois, Francois didn't speak English. He did not speak English. Well, tell, wait, what, and he, what and he would be there with the French. French. What language? Mm -hmm. What language? I know. What, tell the language that he spoke. French. French. Oh, he spoke, he spoke French. French. Okay. But he probably spoke other languages too, because you know, you know, um, uh, Francois is multilingual. So. Oh, he's very he, smart. Uh, Francois brilliant. We right. know that. We all know. Right. That. So he would go there. He'd be there with the drums. Bam, 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 bam. You know. So, I hated. You know, even now, you know, I don't like musicians playing when i'm playing music to have musicians unless they working together with me and it's you know it's coordinated hmm? so i would tell him i would go downstairs to the to the, to the floor and i tell him stop stop <laughs> please stop you know what I mean? and and because because he didn't speak english he didn't know what i was saying or he didn't understand all the music was too loud or whatever he just paid me no money he just thought kept you kept saying he thought you kept saying Go! Go! French, <laughs> what? You know? <laughs> so he just kept he just kept on playing and I just went eventually I went into the console. It was it was hopeless. You know what I'm saying? So anyway, back to the inferno, right? Wait a minute, Kenny, one second. Richie, you had drummers with you playing when you played? Yeah. And what I, and what did you what did you I, think? It's like Kenny, I didn't like it either. Really? <laughs> <laughs> You know what it is, Kenny? Like you said, if you coordinated something ahead of time, otherwise they're just gonna play whatever whatever patterns they think, you know. And they yeah, because they're working for the owner. They right. Working, right. They're playing for the owner. Right. They ain't playing for the DJ or whatever. Right. Mm -hmm. And they may not even know what, what they may have never heard the song you're playing before, so they're not gonna know when the break's coming or when you know when. Right. The, so it's just it, a lot of time. You see it now; it, it still goes on. It's sloppy, you know. Most mm -hmm. of the time, anyway. So you both, you, against drummers, both of you would rather not have any drummers playing with you. Yeah, it's does like, that I, also I, I, does that also include conga player? Conga player, so I don't want no unless they working with me. They standing by me, and I'm telling and them you when, give when to play the congas and when not to. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Okay. I got to be in control of that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so now we're moving forward. Francois, you meet Francois, and everything's going, and then we're in Fernos now. Right, so so now we're in Inferno seventy seven, right? And I'm 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 working lights there. You know what I'm saying? Yep. And um I, like I told you I saw DJs come and go and every time a DJ would get would get fired or he would quit or whatever or leave, decide to leave, I would always tell the owner, Angelo, listen, why don't you let me let me take the, the decks. Let me take the decks, you know? And he would say, No, no, gave me a chance to work, you know, to, to play music at the club. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait, wait. Say it once more. Wait, 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 wait. We lost you. Say it from no. He said no, no to you. Say it again because it was free. Yeah, yeah. He said, he said um, every time when I would, uh, you know, when another DJ would leave and I would say, you know, why don't you let me take over the DJ spot? He would say, no, no, no. You stay with the lights. You're good at the lights. Blah, blah, blah. He would never give me the opportunity to play music at the club. Mm -hmm. What a mistake that is. Yeah, so, 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 the the last DJ that worked there, right, was Renee Hewitt. Renee? That's right, it was Renee. Renee Hewitt. I wasn't going to say his name. You know one thing, I wasn't going to say his name, but I'm going to have to say his name. You know what I'm saying? Because it, it was Renee. Renee worked there for three years. Hmm? He was a great okay. DJ for his own right. Renee was a good DJ, no doubt about it. Renee used to he kill did, the place. He you know did, what I'm saying? He'd he, 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 he do what he needed to do. Yeah, that's right. Renee, Renee was a, a great DJ. But as you know, those sets were some long sets. The set was from 11 p.m. until 9 a.m. So you had to be there. You had to bust out a 10-hour set with vinyl. You know what I'm saying? So... 
That's unheard so, of. Could you imagine that today? Well, telling somebody, telling somebody, you're gonna open up tonight at eleven, <laughs> and you're, and we're finishing at nine a.m. Could you imagine telling these new guys that? Yeah. And what records? And here's the records. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you know. And make it work. And turn right. the place out. That's right. You what know was what the saying? one thing all DJs said? Don't go to the bathroom. You may not have your job. That Frankie me. Knuckles famously said that. He said, "Don't go to the bathroom because when you come back." You, your job is going to be, you, you're going to be fired, baby, and, and escorted out by security. <laughs> he was right. He was right. That's right. Hmm? So, now so you, go ahead. So, you know, after working there for seven years, right, Renee was the only one that would give me a break, right? Renee, after about, uh, you know, at, at like eight o'clock or whatever, you know, Renee would get tired, you know, he'd be tired or whatever, you know. He, and he'd tell me, Kenny, you know, you want to play for a little while? I'm going to take a break, you know? So I said, fine, you know? So this went on for about a year, really, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. On Saturday, you know, at about 8 o'clock, he'd be like, I want to take a break, I want to take a break. So I said, oh, go ahead, I'm going to play, don't worry, you know what I'm saying? So, one night, it's, this, is, uh, this is 1980, right? 1980. Renee decides, Renee tells me, I'm going to go and take my break. I said, go ahead, you want to play? Go ahead, right? So as soon as he went downstairs to the lounge, the doors opened up, the front door, and in walks Mike Stone with Entourage. Mike Stone was the, the main promoter at Studio 54, right? And I, I knew him because I used to go to, I knew him already because I used to go to many of his parties before, before I started working for him. You know? So Mike, Mike walks in and, and he says, where's Renee? You know what I'm saying? And I said, I said Renee's going on for his break, you know? So, you know, I, I had an idea that I was being auditioned. I didn't know for sure, you know, but you I said... Got, you got intuition, you got intuition. You right. Said. So I said, you know one thing? If you never played good in your life, you better play good right now. You know what I'm saying? If you never turned it out before, you, you better turn it right now, girl. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so... I played, played, played my heart out, right? Ripped the place, you know? So they stayed for about 40 minutes or so, you know? And, and when they left, uh, Mike Stone told me, listen, I like your music. How would you like to play at Studio 54? So I said, uh, let me think about it for a minute. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> so he told me, you got the, the job. You start next Saturday. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was John Hernandez was with me because John Hernandez used to hang out with me a lot, and we were all thrilled, excited. Oh my God, this was like a miracle. You know what I'm saying? It was like a, a gift from God. What me at Studio Fifty Four? What? You know what I'm saying? I mean, it was just, it was unbelievable. Hmm? So, so the first night I worked at Studio Fifty Four, right? First Wait, let, let, me say this, let me say this first. You know, Renee wasn't happy. And he still ain't happy with me. I know that, but he doesn't know how much I love him. You know what I'm saying? That's a hard, he, that's a hard thing for anyone to accept because I bet he wanted that job. I would have yeah. tried too. I would want that job. He told me, right? He told me, he said, you will go and you will call those people and you will tell them that that job was meant for me. What? You understand me? He said, <laughs> he said that to you? <laughs> That's what Renee said. And I said, you know, no, bro, I can't do that. Renee. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So anyway, after I left the Inferno, right, and I started working at, three, at, at studio, three weeks later, the Inferno closed. It's funny, it's funny how you do the... What are you, the bearer? He's the three-week three guy. guy. Yeah, you're three-week guy. You come out, you the leave, lights go, and the place closes. It's no more like, white light, three weeks wait, later, gone. So wait, you gave up, you put, you hung your hat with the lights <laughs> in the Inferno, and who took your job? John John? John John, right? I got John John the job working the lights, okay. right, at, at, at um, Inferno, and I started to play at, at, at studio. Now, studio was an all-black crowd, mostly gay. You know what I'm saying? Because that's the following that Mike Stone had. Well, mm -hmm. let's clarify that. So the 70s movies that everybody sees, the Saturday Night Fever thing is that white, mixed mm -hmm. gay crowd with the Broadway mm -hmm. people like like uh, Bette Midler. All those people were hanging out. Mm -hmm. 
Club closes, those guys go to jail. Schrager and Rubel. Mm -hmm. Club reopens, they bring Mike Stone in. Is that how that No, goes? no, that's not how it went. So to break the, it down. Studio 54, when when Schrager and 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 uh, and um I mean when Schrager and um, Steve Rebell when they went to jail, they lost the liquor license to the club. Okay. The authorities they took the liquor license away. And I'm telling you right now, if you got a party in New York and it's white people dancing and you ain't got no liquor, they not coming. <laughs> it's true. You're right. Just that simple. You know what I'm saying? Just that so, simple. So, so what other choices they have? Bringing a black motor and bringing a black crowd because we don't need alcohol, as you know. You know, we don't still don't need alcohol. We feel that alcohol is is is, is something that's forced upon us in clubs. Okay. We really don't want to drink, right? But but we feel that that's forced on us. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even now, you know what I'm saying? Anyway, so 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 Mike Stone was running the club. You know what I'm saying? Now after the Inferno closed, right? Inferno was a Puerto Rican crowd. Right. Inferno was all Puerto Ricans, mostly Puerto Ricans, right? But they all knew me. They all knew me there. You know, I was a popular light man. You know what I'm saying? And they all knew that I started working at Studio 54. And when the Inferno closed, all of those people started to come to visit me at Studio 54. How funny. So, right, so 50, Studio 54 became mixed. It wasn't black gay anymore. It was black Spanish okay. mixed. You know what I'm saying? Right, it's pretty much. And that's the way it stayed for many years after that. And even the garage was like that. It wasn't totally black. It was Spanish mixed, too, in some way. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so, so what am I going to tell you about Studio 54 now? You so wanna wait, I want to, I want to know, Mike Stone tells you, you start next Saturday. Right, what do okay. You, what, no, do right, you do, yeah, what do you do to get this gig together? What did you go and do? Prepare. Right, now, now I'm going to tell you, right, right. Now, now, Nikki Siano was a DJ before me at Studio 54. Nikki Siano, you know what I'm saying? And the gallery resident. Right. Nikki you know what I'm saying? And they got rid of him to hire me. Really? That's right. Studio 54. They fired for him for some reason. I don't know what he did over there, but they wanted him out. You know what I'm saying? Wow. And that's why I started to work at Studio 54. Mm -hmm. And anyway, so the, the first night that I played at Studio 54, wait, wait, let me say this before I say this, right? When they offered me the job, I didn't have no records to play for no 10 hours. How do I play for 10 hours? We're not going to you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, I borrowed, baked, and stole. I, I I even went to my mother's house and I took all of her record collection. I said, I said, Mommy, you don't need to give me these songs. I'm, I'll give them back to you. I went to my brother's house. Give me all your albums. You know, then I, I didn't have much money. You know what I'm saying? But the money I had, I went and I brought every record that I could and some of the records I brought on 45s I would buy two copies so I could extend it you know what I'm saying and play the instrumental from the other side too if I had to you know? so I arrived the first night I'm like oh my god you know I got to bust out a 10 hour set how I'm gonna do it you know what I'm saying and um, Mike Stone I didn't really think that he would believe that I was gonna be able to to handle a 10 hour set so he had other DJs waiting right it was like three other DJs waiting and they had their milk crates with us. They were waiting by the staircase. I could see them from the console. You know what I'm saying? They were waiting. They said, he gonna drop any second. I could feel it. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you know, anyway, long story short, you know, I was able to bust out those 10 hours and I looked at those DJs, you boys might as well just go on home, baby, because I am not getting up off these decks no time soon. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> so anyway, the first night that I played there, Nikki was there because it was my birthday. It was my birthday the night. The first night you played? The first night I played at Studio 54 was my birthday. It was October. It was October the 7th. And I don't know whether that was the exact day, but it was the, the uh, October 1980. Hmm? And so they had a birthday cake for me and everything in the console. You know? Okay, so now here we go. And Nikki, take... Nikki, was, Nikki was helping cut the cake Hang and all that. Bar. He was very gracious. <laughs> hmm? And you would have been playing something like this, I'm going to presume. One of the records. Is it playing? Hang on. Um, sometimes you hum so much louder than the record, I'm like, damn, I hear him humming. And then <laughs> your snaps. Finger and her, snaps. Her crook. Yeah. Okay. 
So our segment, Sing With Lenny. Okay, so we're, did, did, now. Did, did, you, know, you know that Frankie Knuckles and David Morales recorded that, and Satoshi, they recorded that finger snap in the studio. No, I do know that. Know how I mm. know that? Mm. Do you know, how, I don't know if you remember how I know that. Mm. I know that because the phone call came from the studio to my, 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 ha my studio and you said, yo, you know where I'm at right now? I'm like, where? They're recording my snaps. <laughs> I'm like, what snap? He said, bitch, my finger snap. You know my finger snap? I said, Frankie wanted on a record. I'm like, I think it was that Salso thing they were doing, right? I think Frankie used it. I'm not sure. But when, when I listened to his remix of Unbreak My Heart, right? Right, Tony Brax, yeah, and you hear him again. Yeah. That sounded like my finger snap in there. Now, I wasn't sure. I, I, I never Probably really is. got a chance to. Hmm? All right, so now let's get back to the cake. So Nikki's got you. It's your birthday, your first night. What a birthday right. present! Mike Stone sets up you to play as his new DJ, and mm. just so happens to be around your birthday. It could be a couple of days before, or after. The cake mm. is being sliced. Talk about mm. that. Show, bring right. us there. So Nikki, Nikki, Nikki is there, and and Nikki was very gracious. You know what I'm saying? You know, I knew Nikki before that too, but Nikki, you know, we weren't like friends or anything, but I knew him. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So he, um, um, you know, he was helping cut the cake and he was very gracious about the whole thing. You know? Anyway, it was it was a, a difficult to get through that night, right? And, and and we all made it, everybody made it, and, and you know, my employment was for a year at Studio 54, oh, really? every Saturday night. You know? And we had some of the best performances. I mean, we had artists come through there, Grace Jones, Evelyn Champagne King, Chaka Khan, Lolita Holloway, um, Carl Carlton, um, what was her name, Tana Gardner. That was the biggest night that we had, was when, because that, that Tana Gardner heartbeat yeah, that was, oh, was, wow. was the biggest record. Boom, boom, one of the God. biggest records. Boom, 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 yeah, boom, boom, yeah. Boom, that was one of the biggest records that Larry Levan ever, ever, ever remixed. And when we had the show there, right, they they brought out a special curtain with a with a um um with a with a um a heart, right? It was a pendulum. It was a pendulum that they brought down, and it was a um, a heart with all um red strobes on it. And when they started the song, they, they started swinging this pendulum. Heartbeat. It made me feel so weak. And the pendulum is swinging. And when she came and busted out on the stage, I'm telling you, everybody just lost it. Right? Studio 54 would hold like like 2,500 people. It was the capacity of that club. We had 4,000 that night. We had 4,000 people for Tanner Gardner. They were hanging off the balconies and everything. It was incredible. So... I can tell you some more Studio 50. This is what I'm going to tell you my, my, my most famous Studio 54 story, right? Tell us. This is after um, Steve Rebell and Ian Schrager came out of prison, right? Steve came to the club. I didn't know him. I knew of his, you know, I didn't know him personally because, you know, I, didn't, I never worked there when he was um, when he was running the place. You know what I'm saying? So he arrives in the console in the DJ booth and he's got Calvin Klein, Bianca Jagger, and Andy Warhol with him. Mm hmm? So Steve tells me, I want to hear Your Love by Lime. Right? Your Love by Lime. By Lime. You remember that dreadful oh, I song? Know, I know the record. Right. When I when I got that record from the record pool, I opened up my window and flung it out the window. That's how much I like that song. You know what I'm saying? So I said, Steve, you know, I'm sorry, but, um, but I don't have that song. Very nicely, I said it. You know what I'm saying? I'm sorry, Steve. I don't like. I don't. I don't. I don't have that song. You know? Then he tells me, "Listen, you know, I got Calvin and Bianca, and you know they're with me, and they want to hear that song. So, play your love by Lon." You know? So once again, very nicely. You know, I said, "Steve, I'm sorry, but I don't have that, that song." <laughs> you <know>? <laughs> yeah, you read to him the same way he's talking to you. Just like he would tell. <laughs> then he told me, right? He said, you look here. I'm Steve Rebell and I own this place. And I want to hear your love by line right now. So play your love by line, right? Now, Lenny, I'm telling you, I'm not allowing nobody to talk to me that way. I don't give, I'm, well, I was getting ready to say something. I don't care who you are. 
Look at me this week. We're on cable TV. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I don't give a shit who you are. I'm not having nobody speaking to me in that type of tone. You know what I'm saying? So when he said that, right, and, and his attitude, the way he said it, right, I said, Steve, I know that you own this place, but guess what? I don't work for you. I said, and I'm going to tell you another thing. If I had that song, I would never play that song. You know why? Because I hate that damn record. Like that. So when I said that, Calvin and all them, they all heard it. Calvin and Bianca and all of them, right? They were like, <gasps> right? Because, you know, this is the big king, Steve Rebell. You know, nobody talks to him that way, right? So they all stormed out of the, out of the DJ booth, right? The following week, Steve Rebell hired the band, Lime, their Canadian brand, <laughs> flew them in from Canada, right? And had them perform the song live on stage, Your Love, live, right? You know? And he stood at the console like this, just looking at me. He didn't say a word. You know? But you know what surprised me the most, right? Is I never played that song, but when they performed it, the crowd loved it. And you know what a rough audience they were. You know yes. what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. New York, New York, let's, that's what you have to explain to everyone. The New York audience, about making it with a New York audience. How tough is that? Listen, even if you're, if you're, if you had a big hit record and you were a well-known artist, those people in New York, they used to be very, very moody. You know what I'm saying? And if you sang something out of key, or if you jumped on that stage with attitude, right? If you gave them attitude or something like that, they would boo the hell out of you. Boo, really? boo, boo, boo. You know what I'm And it was relentless, I'm telling you. Not like today, was, right? You know, Not like today. Everybody's looking at their phones, writing right. all this crap, yeah, taking yeah. selfies. <laughs> they were more concerned about what you were doing, right? Listen, I saw Evelyn Champagne get booed at Studio 54. What? Right? Right, and and she got booed because when she when her first song was that song Music Box, which everybody hated. Wait, 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 wait. what? Oh, no, I was going to say when in 1980, um, we, I brought her out to Paul Anker's club when I was working for Jubilation, and we flew her out there, Kenny, and she was she was so cool. We picked her up at the airport, and uh, my friend Frankie had like an edit of her song, like I think I'm in Love was big at that time, and I, I don't know if it's right it was like a couple of years before. But he had like a couple of edits done, and she gets in the car. He hits the the release button, and, and she hears the edits. She's like, "Oh, how that?" He goes, oh, "I don't know how that happened." We started laughing, but but that was the first time we did a uh, a track act from New York in Vegas, you know, in a club, mm -hmm. in a place like that. Now, mind you, in eighteen eighty, Vegas, Kenny was like, "Hey," and a couple of things on the strip. It wasn't like today. And I would and, imagine. And I've never these, been to Vegas. And these two honest. these two guys are New York DJs mm -hmm. coming off the disco era. Mm -hmm. and bringing people out and stuff. yeah they weren't into uh disco at that time yeah they I, I weren't was playing into i was playing imports like harlow take off and you know hills of cat man do like late at night and mm -hmm. they were they were more into funk and then we we eventually um got it so that we could play both uh you know like al hudson and cutie pie all those kind of songs and, right and then and then you work your way up in bpms towards the end of the night then you'd be playing your imports yes. and stuff you could even get away with like martin circus and Stuff mm -hmm. like that, but we had to educate that crowd because they there was not enough New Yorkers out there. No, no, in those days especially. No, nope. and even in Europe too, because Europe was not playing the same records we were playing here. Right. In no. fact, we broke mm -hmm. more. In fact, Kenny and Larry probably broke more European records on their That's dance true. floors than actually Europe did. Right, right. Played a lot of them, especially in in, in bonds. A lot we'll of get human to, leagues, we'll a lot get to of, bonds. You know, we're gonna get to bonds. Salt, in a cell, all of that. We were playing all of it. Hmm? So I do remember you mentioning to me one story. Let's we'll, we'll wrap the studio part up because bonds is very important as well. About how the smell in the club was so bad. In studio. Yeah. Tell us why. Right. But that wasn't when I worked there. That was a story that that, I, that that was told to me when I started working there, right? And and they told me that that the um, you know, people were always desperate to get in Studio Fifty Four. They would have paid anything. They would have done anything to get inside. They would just so desperate to get in that club and one guy entered this is before i started working there he entered through a air conditioning vent on the roof somehow enough he got on somehow or another he got on the roof and cl crawled into the air conditioning vent and he got stuck and died there what wow. 
Yes. So the um, well, so the, the myth was so the myth was real. That was a myth. They said that, that was a real story. That was a real story. And they said for weeks and weeks they were smelling this horrible smell in the club. What is that smell? It smelled like a dead body or something. <laughs> and it was because <laughs> you know whenever they would turn the air conditioning on, it was. <laughs> And eventually, they found out that the guy was up in there, and, uh, and that he had died. Uh, tell us, tell us what it was like the ending for you at studio. I know, even though a year is not not that long, but in the in the DJ world, it is a pretty long time to have a residency of that level. Well, well, you know what? One of the reasons that I left Studio Fifty Four, right, is because when 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 Ian and Steve when they got out of jail, they wanted the club back. They got their liquor license back. And they wanted their club back, and they wanted everybody out. Mike Stone and all that. They got rid of Mike Stone. They got rid of everybody. Yeah, you know basically, what basically, what you're saying is they wanted the whole black crowd and Spanish crowd out. They wanted the black crowd out, and they wanted their celebrity. They tried to, to rekindle that celebrity status that they had or whatever, but it never worked out. Because uh, after they became um, convic convicted felons. You know, felons they were they were um the 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 um the celebrities never really came back mm -hmm. and i heard a story too that they um they became kind of blacklisted because um the 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 president of france right they um, um the president of france was there with his wife during that during the time when steve was and then was running it right oh, really some photographer right the, the president of france his wife had on no panties. She had on some dress and she didn't have no panties on, right? And somebody snapped a picture of her hairy pussy. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> it was all over the front pages of the, of the French news. Uh, il bullet, wait, wait, uh, il bullet, uh, il bullet, <laughs> French pussy. <laughs> hairy, <laughs> scary, hairy, scary. <laughs> Right, and so so that's one of the reasons why they they lost a lot after that. You know what I'm saying? They were mm -hmm. all right. So, Mike Stone and you, when do you find out it's over? Studio. Uh, I found out really once Steve Rebell and Ian Schrager came out of jail, we knew that it was over after that, because they had, there was a rumor that they wanted to re restart what they were doing before. You know, and it was just a matter of time before Mike Stone was going to be out the door. So, he here's, so here's, here's what we want to do. We're going to say it's like 19, going on to 1981, right? It's mm. So we, we want to give that, I want to thank you, to thank you for studio. So let's bring yeah. it up. Let's bring that. We want to let, we want to, let me tell you something, everybody. This man, legend beyond legend. I don't even know where to begin, but I will say this. He sent everybody in New York looking for this record. I want to thank you. Trust me. <laughs> Right. Anyway. Go ahead, Kenny. Yeah, because because MCA, I believe that Bobby Shaw was working for MCA at the time, right? Yep. And he gave me the album, the LP, right? And when I heard that song, I was like, oh my God, this is it, you know? And I played that at Studio 54. I played it, and I played it. I'm sure I was the first one to have it, that album. You know what I'm saying? If because Bobby nobody Sh had that If album. Bobby Shaw is out there watching, Bobby, write in and let us verify that, Bobby Shaw. And I played that song, and it became a big hit at Studio 54, and then it just went viral after that. That was a great song. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Thank you for that, Kenny, because I always did say you were the one. I have That's to... I got to give you credit where credit's due. You broke that record in New York. I broke that song. Dwayne Holt sure. even said that to me. He said, anybody I know played that record was Kenny Carpenter. Rock that That's record. Right. That's what? right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so back to the the glory and the, of studio and the whiteness is coming back over the darkness again. Right. <laughs> so so when studio closed, you know when 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 studio after Steve Rebell died, right? Because actually when they when they started their parties, it didn't go any more for than about a year before before Steve got sick, and they realized that they weren't going to be able to rekindle what they had before. Remember? Mm -hmm. So they started to rent the place out, and they started, actually, um, Vega played there. Larry LeVan started doing some parties there during the week, you know? And it was crazy because Larry, um, after I left studio... Yeah, but that's later on. That's real later on. Yeah, yeah but they took the sound system out. Yeah, they no. got rid of the Richard Long sound system, and they got some crazy, with those white speakers, I don't know what kind of speakers those were that they had in there. But once they got rid of that Richard Long sound system... That was the end of the place. 
And Larry LeVan started working there, right? And Larry had them cover the whole DJ booth, the top of the DJ booth with plexiglass. I don't know why. You know what I'm saying? But he had the, 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 the cover, the whole booth. Hmm? Well, Maybe he was afraid somebody was going to throw something at him or whatever. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> he covered it. You know? <laughs> yeah, I remember that. I remember that booth was all plexi. <laughs> Yeah, and Vega was doing some parties there too. I think here and there. And I and I was and I was, quite a few people were working. There. I played for Bear Jones there, but I played on that horrible system. It was horrible. Why did they take out a? Yeah, room? the system that they had that they put. Well, I don't know why they got rid of the. A the I don't want to talk about where the system went, but I did hear that it was taken out one night. Overnight stolen. The whole oh, system. Oh, that's why it was taken out. Because what? Oh, the Studio Fifty Four, the Richard Long system was stolen. Well, I don't know how they did that because a lot of those speakers were were no, up on the boat. They, they waited. They waited for everybody to go home, and then they they had a whole crew of people. I heard. Wow. They cleaned. Well, out. They had an eighteen wheeler truck outside, and they were oh, out. Oh my the god! With it. Oh lord! I think it was the Duncan brothers that did the system after something like that. Duncan, because they put that it system. Was they put the system, the amp racks downstairs mm. under the booth in glass. Everything was plexi. Mm. Oh, it's horrible. Mm. Mm. Yeah, so Bonds International now, the next right. biggest dance floor in New York so, City. So after studio, right, Mike Stone, you know, calls me up and he's like, listen, I got another club. I want you to come down, come to Manhattan now. I want you to see this club. So I go, we go to Bonds. And when I arrived, when I saw the Bonds, I was like, oh, my God, I never seen any place that big. And I never seen any dance floor that big in my life. I hadn't. Still to this day, to be honest with you, I've never seen a dance floor that big in a club. Hmm? It was like a football field. Hmm? <laughs> and uh, Mike Stone, when I saw the club, I loved the club, but I hated this, the, um, the acoustics were terrible. It had the worst acoustics that I ever heard in my life. And I felt like it was such a... Um, you know, like, you know, after leaving Studio 54, I was like, oh, my God, now i got to work in this dreadful place. You know what I'm saying? You know, I just hated it in the beginning. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> but. You made it work. Everybody started coming. All of the people that went Studio 54, they, they followed Mike Stone and they followed me into Bonds. You know what I'm saying? And Bonds, you needed 3,000 people just to have the, the to, to make the place look full if you had less than three thousand people it looked empty mm -hmm. and the place can hold like five thousand mm -hmm. so um it's the biggest dance that, floor in new york city there's that nothing big. bigger that's all because i know that this yeah, know. the biggest dance floor right. in new york right and they, they had a richard long sound system but they didn't spend the money on the acoustics right to, to do the room, you know, and to treat the room the way Richard wanted to do it. You know, they didn't they didn't come up with the funds, so he just left it the way it was. Mm -hmm. So they had a disease called Funzolo, like in Italy. Yeah. Funzolo. <laughs> <laughs> Funzolo. The farms turned out to be, um, um, I hated it in the beginning, but I learned to love it. I learned to love it. And once you got those people in there, they had acoustic problem. But what I learned is that once you have 3,000 people on the dance floor, they create acoustics. People create acoustics. Yeah, they pick mm -hmm. up. Yeah, they dry. It's like they they absorb the sound. Right. Yeah. So you know, we, when we were packed all the time, we were packed. You know, every every you know, we would have at least twenty five hundred in the place, mm -hmm. and and that's what made bonds fun, is when you had the um, all those people arrive. Wow. And uh, Studio Fifty Four. Bonds, those were two of the, the, the best experience I have, experiences that I ever had working as a DJ. Okay, so now let's take it in further now. And let's talk mm -hmm. about some of the darker period of Kenny Carpenter. So, you know, the, 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 the music ends and life changes for you. It doesn't really end, well, but uh, you, you take us on well, that trip. Well, I'm going to tell you, you know, when I, when I worked at Studio 54, right, I was a heavy Coke user. No, Coca-Cola? <laughs> <laughs> is that how you did 10 hour sets 11 hour with coca-cola all night i mean i mean you know when you worked at studio 54 you know coke was popular i mean you know they got the coke spoon and the moon and everything it's of course everybody wants to do a hit you know so i'm telling you i used to have drug dealers 
waiting online to give me cocaine. They would be cute, you know what I'm saying? And um, that that drug addiction, you know, I became addicted to coke, and you know, and I carried that from Studio Fifty Four to Bombs. Mm. Kenny Summit, you, you got a gig, Kenny? A gig just came in. <laughs> 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 Somebody, Sam Pressman just asked, what was that club called? Bonds International Studio. Bonds, it's an, we called it Bonds International Casino. All right, okay. Was, but, wasn't nothing casino about it, but that's what we, That's what's cool. Bic, so, sure. so you had, so you had the, the, the white powder everywhere around you. Mm -hmm. free, of, free of charge, of course, because you are the party. Right. You so, are so, the party. So um, um, what happened, right, is, is I carried that cocaine right from Studio 54 into bombs. You know? And, it, and it, it eventually it became a big problem for me. You know? Now I'm going to tell you one thing that happened, right? You know, because, because I was, um, you know, I wasn't just on coke, you know, but any drug that somebody give me, I just take it. You know really? what I'm saying? <laughs> No, Kenny, you're a virgin. You don't know about no drugs. <laughs> I'm going to tell, tell you something that happened at Bonds, right? I, I was high on coke. So somebody asked me, do you want some heroin? I don't know who it was, right? So I said, sure, why not? You know what I'm saying? So I took this two and two of heroin. Mm -hmm. So right after I took the heroin, I felt the sweat coming down from rolling down from my face. You know what I'm saying? And my heart beat was... Yeah. So Mike Stone runs in. Don't oh, wait. Um, one second, please. Mm -hmm. Yep. I gotta come right back to you. Hold on, we're gonna go do a song. Since we gotta go to a commercial break. Oh, song. Let's play Call B. Let's bring it up. Make it nice and loud for everybody. Call B. Oh. <laughs> Definitely gotta play some Kano and yeah. some Candidate for Love. Isn't this story? Let's let me get in there. Let me break it down. Yo, is it this story? The shit or what? I say I don't even want to stop the camera. The more he talks, the more I'm like. Oh, it's, it's very interesting. Very interesting. And it's real. I like the uh, the dead guy in the uh, on the chimney. I like that story. The dead guy is awesome. <laughs> it smells in here. What yeah, is but it? it smells, it smells like, like crap. A dead body. Here we go. A commercial break, so we're going to call me. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in to the Common Power wrap up show with Richie Scotty, my guest, oh, yeah. and Kenny Carpenter, full studio 54 DJ. Okay. The book is Nature's in the Sky. Yeah. He's on Vegas, yeah. now, right? And we and yeah. Cause I'm happy Kept me And again Yes, I'm again Ain't no thoughts of that A lot of people do I was born this, this way, way. Yeah, yeah. I know. This is your new York You can't try That's your fear of the way I know I'm behind the screen. I know you can't see me because I'm talking to the people. Oh, okay. But, when but I you walk, see me. Check this out. I know you're back. I know I see Kenny's back. When I walked into Tom Moulton's house, okay, Tom Moulton mixed this record. Mm -hmm. And I saw the, the actual multi-track sitting by his bathroom. It said, Born This Way, 
Delegation, I think it was, the name of the group. Mm -hmm. He's had that multi-track for 45 years, right? Wow. He doesn't know that it's the record's renamed Call B. I was born this way. He knows it's Delegation. Delegation. They that get, was they whatever. Like I, I don't know if it's delega or, yeah. something like Delegation or con Congregation or something like that. And this is the record. I always hear this record. I think of that multi-track. I'm sitting there going, oh my God, this born this way. He doesn't even realize it. He didn't realize it was the same record. Right, right. Meanwhile, this record became huge in the club scene. Okay. Look at that bass line. Oh, the shit. That bass is crazy. So Kenny, take us. Are you okay? Are we, are we back from the commercial break? Because everybody's loving your story. Yes, I'm back. I'm back. Okay. So where do we? Where were we? Where were we? Bond we were International. So heroin is now. You're sweating. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. So I, I was telling that story, right? So you know, I take this. I'm already high on coke, and I do this like one and one or two and two of heroin. You know. So right after when I feel the sweat running out of my face and my heart beat is starting to increase, or whatever. Mike Stone runs in. The show is getting ready to start. <laughs> Chaka Khan, right? So I said, oh, right? Then, Which one? Which Chaka Khan song? No, there's a show getting ready to start at Bond. <laughs> and it's like, Chaka Khan. You're like, Chaka right? Khan, he, what? <laughs> so he gives me the reel-to-reel -reel tape with the music for Chaka. It was on reel to reel You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, at, during those days, they didn't have a, 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 a separate engineer that was doing the show when so you were the DJ. Were, so you were the engineer as well? <laughs> you got Yeah, when you were DJ, you got to be the one engineering the show as well. You know what I mean? <laughs> That's the way it was. So when they gave me the tape, I put the tape, you know, I had the Technics reel to reel, and I put the the, 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 the reel to reel on there, right? But, and then, um, but I forgot to lock it down. The reel, you know what I'm saying? And when I went to go press rewind, the whole reel came <laughs> off of the thing, right? So the and tape spooled off, off onto the ground. Right, and and the tape was all over the DJ booth. The, all of the tape of Chaka Khan's music was everywhere. I mean, it was all on the cutting room floor, baby. <laughs> and I looked, I was like, oh my God, you know what I'm saying? I, I was in a panic after that, you know what I'm saying? Luckily, Chaka Khan is a smart girl and she had a backup. Ooh. She had backup tape, right? It wasn't the only one she had. Luckily, because we weren't able to pull that, that tape back together after it was all over the floor like that. It stood on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> did, Mike, did Mike Stone freak out or is he high as well at the same time? Um, Mike Stone just looked at me. Mike Stone never really freaked out. He wasn't the type of guy to freak out. He was like, oh, well, you know what I'm saying? I'm just, oh, you know what I'm saying? What, what are we going to do now? You know what I'm saying? Blah, blah, blah. You know, so they, they pulled it together. They found another tape that she had, and they came in, and somebody else did it after that. I didn't do it. And I was like, you, you guys got to handle that. I can't handle it. Hmm? Right. But those were the consequences of my drug use, you know? And um, I could go on and on, but, you know, I... I'll tell you, you know, that was in the 80s and my coke my coke addiction ended in the 90s because I started to go to drug meetings and I got counseling and I got help. <laughs> Kenny! And we, were, and we were all there with our pom-poms out. Remember, we were like, yes, Kenny. Yes, but that was a rough run. I had like a five-year run. That was a rough run for me, baby. You know? I remember. And, uh, I'll tell everybody now, you know, just... Follow the, the, what Nancy Reagan said. Just say no. You know what I'm saying? Follow her motto. Hmm? What to how much of no? Which part of no? <laughs> <laughs> so, so let's go on now. So, you know, you come back, you do BLS, 30 BLS in New York, right. you do uh, the. No, no, there's a lot of things that happen in between them. Okay. So I worked at Bonds for two years, right? Now, when Bonds closed, Bonds went out of business. In mean, the same way all those other clubs are going out of business, Bonds went out of business, and I found myself outside looking in. You know what I'm saying? And the, the, and so happened that that a month before Bonds closed, I met David Morales. 
Because because Louis Sierra, remember Louis Sierra? Of course, God may bless. he rest in peace. Right. Yeah, our friend, right. our good friend Louis. Right, I was living out by Coney Island, right? And and um and and, and Louis Sierra lived out there. He told me, listen, I got somebody. I want. I got this DJ. He does some club in Brooklyn, and he wants to meet you. Can I bring him by your house? So I said, sure. So he comes by with David Morales. Hmm? And David Morales went with me to the closing party of Bonds. That's the the, the, the the first time I started hanging out with David, right? So after the club closed, David told me, listen, I got this this little club in Brooklyn that I'm running. I'm, I'm running the place. It's called the Ozone Lair. How would you like to come and play with me out there and share a night with me? So I said, sure, you know, because he had Friday nights and, you know, like normal from 11 till 9. You know what I'm saying? 10 hours, that that's 10, 11 hours. hours. Yep. So that was the standard at that time. You know what I'm saying? So I, I, I went and started working with, with David Morales at the Ozone Lab, right? And we would do uh, we would do alternating two hour sets. Right. So say I would come in and play from 11. You know, if I started at 11, I'm going to play till two. Right? So maybe I'll do three hours in the beginning. You know, between 11 and 12, there's nobody there anyway. You know what I'm So just, you know, imagine the, the, the party starting at midnight. Right. So I play from 12 to 2. Morales play 2 to 4. And then I come back 4 to 6. And then Morales come back at 6 to 8. Right? And we had so much fun. I had so much fun playing with David Morales. And we had this competition going on, right? We would, um, first of all, we would do the sound. We were in control of the sound. We used to bring up additional speakers in and all that, you know? And I would tell David Morales, right? Right? I would tell him, you think you're a good DJ, but tonight, I'm going to let your ass have it. So you better play good. You better work you hard. You better work, yeah, you better work hard. <laughs> right. And then he told me, you know, he would tell me, no, you're not all that. You think you're all that, but that's all in your mind. I'm going to serve you tonight, bitch. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the way we were, we were all night. You know what I'm saying? And the people loved it. You like, know, you were having, the, like you were having personal war. Who could be better? And, and, you know, and David, you know, after I came on, after I busted the place, he know when he comes on, he got to play. You better play, baby, because I'm letting you have it. You know what I'm saying? And that made the party so amazing. So David was a big part of Morales was a big part of my story, big part, and Ozone Lab. And it so happened that we had Carl Bean live at the Ozone Lab In singing out "Born This Way." You know what I'm Yep. And that was a great performance. Wow. Only 300 people. That place was a maximum 300 people. You know, we used to pack it every Friday night. I hmm? bet. Easy for you to pack it too. In Brooklyn wasn't Brooklyn like it is today. That was a right. rough area where he had that ozone. Flatbush line. Avenue, Flatbush Avenue. Yeah, it was rough. on that road. You know that. Believe me. Rough area in those days. We're talking a different. It's not the. It's not the. It's not the gentrified. We can walk around New York all night no. long. No, it was very different. You could have your ass kicked on that road. Believe me. <laughs> yeah. And it happened. A lot of people. Right. Got... As a matter of fact, I'm gonna tell you a story about the ozone layer, right? That many people don't know, right? But before we started working there, right? They had a robbery at that place, right? A gunman walked in, right? Now imagine the map, the capacity is 300, right? Two gunmen or whatever walked in and they said, they told the DJ, turn down the music, turn that music. This is a robbery, right? I want everybody right now to take off all of your clothes, right? Take off your clothes, right? Your watches and your jewelry. They had like three, four, or five big duffel bags. Your watches, your jewelry, your wallet, Everything. all goes into this duffel bag. Your clothes will go into this other bag here, right? And they left the place, right? And they took all of the bags with the clothes and robbed the people and took all of their jewelry and their money and everything and left them in their new. <laughs> Know about this story. This is a story you forgot to tell. Any. This is a story you never told any of us. You were quiet. Yeah. Wow. So, so you know, Bonds, Bonds, um, um, was for about. I think I worked there a year and a half, almost two years. You know, and then when Bonds closed, that was really the beginning of the end for me in New York after Bonds. 
Because when once you, once you go in, you're in the biggest club in New York City. It's hard to go down. Right. <laughs> when you, <laughs> you already hit the pin. You can only go to something smaller. Right. You're not getting nothing bigger, right? You know? And then um, um, I started doing some more parties with Mike Stone in the mid '80s. Morales did a few parties with him too, whatever. But Mike um, had a, a terrible drug issues, whatever that he couldn't overcome, you know. And the, the parties started going down. Everything went down after that, you know, after Bonds. Bonds was the, the beginning of the end. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, the end of an era, like they said. They, they tossed that phrase around so much, but that was truly the end of an era for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it truly was. And you know what? Thankfully, it was an end of an era because you wouldn't be here today if you didn't stop. Right. Right. I know you always so, told me that. You've always said that. Right. So, so I'm going to tell you, right, I was still getting high. After Bonds closed, right? I was still getting high. But the drug dealers, they wasn't queuing up for me anymore. There wasn't, you know what I'm saying? Wasn't nobody giving me any pretty packages anymore. I had to go out there and get it myself, you know? Yeah. So, you know, I didn't realize this here until now. But in, I mean, not until 20 years after my recovery, right? But in 1985, my mother passed away. And when my mother passed away, I started smoking crack. And that crack addiction went on for five years, right? So I got clean in 1990. And a lot of stuff happened in between then, but I got clean in 1990, right? And after I got clean, everything came back to me. It was like a miracle. You know, I had to get a regular job. I got a phone call at my job, right? I was working for Lane Bryant and I got this phone call. And they said, um, they said, somebody's on the phone for you, right? I get on the phone, it's John Robinson from WBLS. May he rest in peace. I get John on the phone. Robinson. Said, yeah. Yes. And he said, he said, um, um, and he said, um, is this Kenny Carpenter? He said, this is John Robinson from WBLS. I'm like, is this a joke? John who? You understand? Is this some kind of joke or something? No, this is John Robinson. And I want you to do the Saturday night mix with me and the mix at six during the week. You know what I'm saying? And I was like, uh, let me think about it for a minute. Um, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Back to that again. Back to that again. Let me, let me have a long thing. Um, okay. So I started doing... I started to do... Um, um, after I recovered in 1990, um, um, I started to do WBLS. And I got some, um, some call. No, I got some call. I started to do some parties in New York too, some warehouse parties. With Greg Day. Remember Greg Day? I, I started doing some events for him. I worked right? for him as well. Wild Pitch. And, uh, yep. Right. Wild Pitch parties. I did quite a few of them, right? And and I was doing one of those Wild Pitch parties. And, and there were some people there from Japan at the party. And they came over to me, right? After the club closed, they said, are, are you Kenny Carpenter? And I said, yes. You know, they said, how would you like to come to Japan to play? You know? I said, sure. Why not? You know what I'm saying? So the next thing I knew, I was in Japan, and I started traveling all over, everywhere. That that after I got clean, the gates of heaven opened up for me once again. You know what I'm saying? Luckily for you. I and I was able to, to to reinvent myself some type of way. You know what I'm saying? Uh huh. And the whole traveling thing began with the house music. Yeah, it began. You know, I started traveling a lot. I started um um. Working in Japan, but working in London a lot too, because when the Ministry of Sound opened, um, the first American DJ they had was Larry Levan, and the second one they had was me. Right, I remember. Just, Justin Berkman sent for me. Hmm? Yep. So, that was, that's the way it went, brothers and me. And yeah, I remember, and I remember spending a lot of time with you when you were doing those times, when you were doing the BLS Master Mixes, and right, yes, and yes. all together. And it, it was rough, you know, because you know now we got the internet. You know, I can make a, 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 a you know, I can make a, a CD at home, whatever, and then post it in five minutes. But but during that, during those times, all of the music that they had that they played on BLS, it was only deliverable on reel to reel. That's right. That's right. So I had right. to make real to real tapes and deliver the show every week. Of course I recycled those those um those tapes. You know what I'm saying? Because real to reels were expensive. I remember. Yeah, that was like, you know, you had to get ready to kick out about sixty bucks or fifty dollars, whatever, for a reel, you know? Mm-hmm. You're gonna get the good one. Mm-hmm. Yep. And like, you know, they weren't paying me for that. 
I remember we had, a, we had that controversy letter. We talk about that. Right. And that's how I felt I would be LS. Because, because I asked them, I told them, listen, no, you know, I'm spending all this on. money. Wait, wait, let me clarify. So you had a meeting with me, Lady Rock, and you read the right. letter to us. And what did we, and you read the letter that you wrote. Right, right. And it didn't go over well. And we all <laughs> said to you, don't do it. And you said, I need to be paid for my time. Right. And I said, you know, I'm buying, I'm buying reels, or whatever. They wouldn't give me any money to buy all these reels, or whatever. You know, and then I got to make it from Brooklyn into Manhattan. That's you know right. I got to handle. I remember you yelling at us. <laughs> you I got to you know hand deliver this thing. I got to right. make the reel. I said, Kenny. let me tell you something. When I gave them that letter, they were not feeling me at BLS, right? And they told me, right? <laughs> they told me you should be lucky that you plan on BLS. That's right. Kenny who? You know what I'm saying? Right? They, they gave me that kind of attitude. And then after that, I left. I quit. But after we reading them. But we Excuse warned me. you. We warned you that. We said, don't right. do it. You know don't but do I it. I thought that it was going to be a different outcome, but it wasn't. I said really to so you, good. I said to you, remember we had this conversation, Lady Rock, we were all together. We said, don't, don't do it. You were like, and I did it. I did it. And it's stupid to do it because it, 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 it didn't work, go over well. Hmm? Well, you know what? It's part of a learning process, too. You learned That's a lot right. from it. That's right. Mm -hmm. But I still, you know, I had no regrets about that, though. No, you shouldn't have any regrets. Right. Because they still should be paying their DJs <laughs> they have over there, whatever. Even now. Even if you ain't, I, you know, they should come up with some money. They making money over there. Mm -hmm. I know. I, I agree. I agree. That's mm -hmm. a whole other thing. Um, I should be happy that, that I'm on BLS, but they should be happy that they have me as well. You know what I'm saying? So it goes both ways, right? That's right. Mm hmm Tell us, Kenny, about, we know that part, we also know about the whole house music thing, um, but what happens now forward in your house career? You leave New York, you go to Rome, and right. everything else that happens. I moved to Italy, you know what I'm saying, and I, um, you know, one of the reasons that I left New York was because of, of George Bush. I didn't like George Bush. And I didn't like uh, um, what happened on September the 11th. I wanted to be out of New York. Right. And another thing is, as you know, Lenny, I don't like flying. And all of my work was in Europe. Right. And I got tired of all of that flying back and forth. I was getting ready to have a nervous breakdown. I remember that. Yep. Yeah, every time when I get on a plane, I think all I, all I could think of is we're going to crash. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> we're going down. You know what I'm saying? That's, you know, and that started affecting my, my, my mental stability. Hmm? Yep. And my work was in Europe. I and my mother told me one time, wherever they're paying you, that's where you need to be. And you ran. She. <laughs> my, and so I decided that, that it was time to leave. Hmm? Because um, New York after Bonds era and, 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 and all of that New York, you know, after those big clubs closed, Paradise Garage and Bonds and all of that there, New York was pretty much finished after that. Yeah, I know. In my opinion. Hmm? I mean, you know, you had the Sound Factory bar that came. That was great. You know what I'm saying? And you had the Sound Factory and all that. Those were the, the, the last of those those big club era and, and great days in New York for me. Hmm? Well, Kenny, we can go on and on, darling. And I mm. love you, but we have to wrap up. And this was the most unplugged, incredible interview well, let's do part two soon. We're gonna have to do part two. Did you like it? Because the people loved it. They were I writing. It. They're writing to you. Yeah, I loved it. But but as you know, you know, if, if you know, you know, I'm a great storyteller, whatever. And we could go on for hours and hours and hours. There's still so much left to tell. You know what I'm saying? And but I'll save all that for the book. Yeah, we'll do part two. We will do part two. And let everybody. I guess you know what they're gonna ask us to do part sure. two. Sure. But, sure. but we got to let you go because I know you're busy as well. It's 9 o'clock, coming on 9 o'clock okay. in Rome. And I got to wrap up here. And I want to okay. thank everyone again from, from our studio in New York. A Ghetto MTV special, Unplugged. The wrap-up show with Mr. Kenny Carpenter. Kenny, pleasure to, um, I want to meet you in person, so I'm going to have to get over to Europe, but, uh, Same great. here, Richie, same here, man. Get my, get my, my contact We will in a minute, we will in a minute, we'll call you back. And, uh, Kenny, great, great stories, man. Is there anything last you want to say to everybody before I cut you off? 
you know, I want to thank all of the people that supported me during those times. And I want to thank the people that still support me today. You know what I'm saying? And you know one thing? The gift of music is something that we share that can never be taken away from us. And it will always be. You know? That's right. That's right. So thank you from the bottom of my heart for everybody that supported me for so, so many years. Not just in America, but in Europe as All well. All over the world. Mm -hmm. Everywhere. And like I said, Kenny saw. Arigato, Kenny saw. Kenny saw. Hey, Arigato. And love. <laughs> All over the world. You know what I'm saying? That's what we got to do. That's Keep it. spreading love, baby. That's mm -hmm. it, Kenny. Thank you, Kenny, so much. Have a great night. Grazie we love mille, you. Kenny. We love you, baby. Ciao, Kenny. Okay. Let me, let me, let's, let's, let's wrap this up with Mr. Rich. Richie, tell us. That was, give that, us, that give was us, some interesting stuff. Give us your, say. give us your, you know. Well, I didn't, I'd like to meet Kenny. I, you know, I know, obviously knew his name, that's what he is, but interesting story. Very interesting story. I'm glad he bounced back from the problems that he had. The thing and, is, uh, is that people don't understand how entailing the drug scene is to all this. Well, back then, especially, because I, I, when I when I came back from Vegas, I was working in Queens, in, um, first in Forest Hills Swim and Dance Club, but then I wound up in, uh, Pallets eventually, but it had Veronica camouflage. But by the time I got to Pallets, which was phase two, before that it was Eclipse, and that's when drugs were like rampant. Yeah, it was like all that fun house. I mean, the biggest, the biggest drug in the fun house, mescaline, uh, poppers. Yeah, the, the anal nitrate and angel dust. Right, and um, it's funny. Big when, time. When he told the story about the real to real, I'm not going to mention the guy's name, but my light man. Uh, and you remember that booth in phase two? Yeah, the one My, with the swimming pool ladder. Yeah, you had to go up and you get electrocuted if your feet were wet. Yeah. Um, we had Sylvester there one night and he was whacked out on, he was doing blow and amyl nitrate and he loaded up the reel because like he said, there's no engineer, either, either the DJ or the lightning was going to be the engineer and spun out of control, ripped up the tape and Sylvester was flipping out, screaming at everybody. And, and that and that's how it, and that's, thank God and, he had a metal cassette and he gets and a metal cassette, metal cassette and he saved it like and Chaka Khan sing, had a backup and reel sings. but this is the story and the tales of what night clubbing was like I want to thank everyone for tuning in my co-conspirator Richie Scott my man Lenny Fontana and Kenny Carpenter ah incredible I'm Lenny Fontana we will see you next week We'll make another now, so we got another great artist coming through to come and hang out here at the studio in New York. Take care and have a great week. Thanks.